Well, hello, everybody. I'm Jake Glazer with the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Uh, and today I am very uh, excited, honored, uh, and pleased to, to welcome an incredible individual to our speaker series, um, John Cohen, who I actually met, I feel like it's it's probably six plus, six years ago, Amsterdam International AIDS Conference. Uh, I was walking through the halls and I saw a photo expose of yours um, and we just started chatting and uh, surfing came up and we had all these these interesting overlapping lifestyle uh, interests, um, including our history in HIV and AIDS. And uh, you are to say you are an accomplished you know, journalist, photojournalist um, and uh, an editor in that space is probably the greatest understatement I can think of. Uh, I no, that's, that's kind of you, Jake. Thank you. And it is we do have this uh, funny intersection of surfing and HIV, which uh... <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's not many people have and it's funny and it's it's interesting because someone I recently spoke to on the series as well uh, was Tom Hewitt uh, who founded Surfers Not Street Children in Durban South Africa um, and uh, I've just always felt that you know there is a place for the alternative sport industry and surfing to really create an impact and a space for youth uh, to receive information and education in, in perhaps a more impactful way than some of the, the processes that we've had in the past um, and it's not only surfing, but I think it's just the lifestyle we represent. So, um, but we can, uh, we can get into that and I'd love to hear, you know, some stories and in, in how you see that intersection. Um, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. How are you today? Good. I had a good surf, uh, but I've been filing stories like mad and been involved with a Twitter, uh, uh, dust up. That's, uh, all right occupying part of my day i i try to avoid the twitter kind of schoolyard fights but when people <laughs> say things that are inaccurate i tend to reply to clarify things I, I don't really mind people attacking me it's just when they get things wrong i like to correct the record <laughs> so, sure well well i mean i think that as you just said i mean so many of the points you just you just brought up has been not only a driving force of our organization and where my mom started with the work uh, in, in funding research in the beginning and in interdisciplinary medical research and really pushing people to challenge each other's thought process, um, not only in how we approach uh, developing treatment for HIV and AIDS, but even as we look at where we are now, challenging the thought process and, and the perspective and approach and how we educate and how we continue to kind of move that needle in this last you know potential, let's say, three to five miles of the marathon where we have these immense goals that, that we've put out there to say, we need to end this once and for all end HIV AIDS and children and families um, as a global community. Um, and there are a lot of people rallied around this. One of the things I've experienced being 37 now HIV positive born HIV positive um, is there are these moments where I think that we see that, oh my gosh, we've spent a lot of time focusing on one community and not focusing on another and, and, and key demographics can slip through the cracks and, and even platforms or programs to reach uh, at-risk populations. And I think a lot of that is focused around youth. Um, and, and we do a lot of the pedi of pediatric work, work within the organization. Um, I think the door needs to be swung wide open to, to re-engage challenging thought process, innovation, and taking the new information and finding better ways to disseminate that. Yeah, well. I, I, absolutely. And, you know, what, what year did uh, Elizabeth Glazer Foundation start? When did the Pediatric Foundation start? It was 80, 87. So, you know, your mom starts a foundation at a point in time when there are no biomedical interventions that work. Nothing. Right. right. I mean, AZT comes out that year. It adds 18 months of life to people who are just tragically dying young and, you know, and it's toxic. There's just really not much biomedical hope for people. But sure. come 1994, there's a great success when it's recognized that pregnant women who receive infusions of AZT don't transmit to their babies as frequently. Mm. And uh, you know, that's a great biomedical advance, but it takes years before that becomes available widely. And it's really not sure. something the world can use at first. And, you know, your your foundation recognized that because IV drips just were too difficult to do in much of the world. And then we have an advance with pills. Oh, you can do single dose nevirapine. Oh, you can just treat 
the pregnant woman for her own HIV infection with good combinations and prevent. So we have these tools that build and build and build. And in my life, I've seen an explosion of success, but I yeah. haven't seen the concomitant explosion of success in applying the tools. Yes, mm -hmm. driven down mother to child transmission all over the world in really dramatic ways, but there's still too much of it occurring. There's still you know, 10 million people today who are living with HIV who aren't on treatment. Half yep. the kids who are living with HIV today don't have access to antiretrovirals. That's just outrageous, you know? Yeah, it's so, completely unacceptable. It's completely unacceptable. And it's like, and so we do have to, I agree with you wholeheartedly. We, we have to ask ourselves, how do you reach these people? Why aren't they getting, it's not the cost of the medicine. That's no longer right. a barrier. Right. So do they not know their HIV status? Okay, if that's the issue, where do you do testing? And one thing that we've learned over the years is take the testing to where people congregate who are going to transmit. If it's a bar or if it's people shooting drugs or if it's people going to a brothel, those are great places to do testing. And for a lot of teenagers, you know, where are they hooking up? I, yeah. I mean, that's a tough question, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I also think it's... um you know, there's the experiential side of what young people are used to in this world, you know, activating young communities, I think is is something that we've become so good at with technology that we have now, being yeah. able to spawn an event, have kind of a flash moment where you can get people to congregate around a specific experience. And, and an example that I give is, is uh, the foundation and myself and some other partners um, uh, worked on a, a, a documentary called Doing My Drugs. And it was with this uh, Danish Zambian uh, singer songwriter. He's like number top three in the charts in Denmark. He's HIV positive. Um, father's Danish, mother's Zambian. And we packaged a concert and it was a test for ticket. And so we just said, you know, this isn't going to be, uh, it's not going to look clinical. We marketed this as a rock and roll experience. And we had local DJs that came from the local region. And we really said, let's test the, the status of stigma when the right carrot is dangled in front of this community. And uh, in four, four, four and a half weeks, we tested 11 and a half thousand adolescents. Um, they all got their results back prior to the concert. And every single one of them came to the concert and they were receiving this information from a more of a, of, of I don't want to say unassuming, but the typical, not the typical messenger of the information. Um, but we were able to create a unifying experience, bringing these young people together in a similar action to where they saw prosperity for their future. They saw health as an option and that showed them a different path that they may be able to walk down. You know, Jake, you've just tapped into something that's exactly where I've seen success again mm -hmm. and again. I did a story about a church in Nigeria, which has more HIV, uh, more children born with HIV than any country in the world, not per capita, but in just yeah. in terms of absolute numbers. And there was a, a researcher who recognized that Nigerians are very religious. They go to church, they go to mosques, you know, every weekend. So mm -hmm. he started having the religious leaders say, if you're thinking of having a baby, if you're pregnant, come forward now during the service for a special blessing. And he, the, he or she would give a special blessing and then would say, you know, after the service in the back of uh, the church or the mosque, we're doing testing for all sorts of things. We're going to test for malaria. We're going to test for hepatitis. And we're going to test for HIV. It wasn't billed mm. as an HIV program. Right. But it, it reached these women who were not being tested, who didn't yeah. know their status. And if they then tested positive, they were brought in to receive treatment. That's the sort of clever strategic thinking that I think is all too often missing. And what mm. you're talking about with the concert, it's exactly it. That's the point. You're going to the place where people hook up. All right. Totally. <laughs> that, totally. That is the environment. That's where the yeah. virus wants to be. So, sure. you know, we don't have shopping malls that teenagers are going to these days, right? And not that I went to them when I was a teenager. I hated them. <laughs> and I still hate them. Can't stand them. But, but we don't have town plazas. We don't have these, you know, people meet online and then where, how do you intervene online? So that, there sure. are groups that do interventions online, and those are clever, those work, but it's that kind of thinking that ultimately is going to move the needle 
in getting yeah. more people tested and getting more people on treatment. And I, I look at COVID and I sit there and I say, as challenging as it's been and all the hurdles we faced in the last two and a half years of going through this, I think a silver lining in that um, and and something that I'd like to, to open up as a discussion is on one hand, uh, as an HIV positive individual, knowing and experiencing the stigma that I went through in my life and still can experience at times, to sit in like UCLA parking lot with like a thousand other vehicles and everyone going to get vaccines and get tested at the same time without shame of, you know, what if I'm positive? What if I put people at risk? I understand it's a different experience when it comes to a sexually transmitted um, disease and an issue like HIV. There's different behavioral stigmas that exist in that. Um, but all of a sudden I was like, wow, social media and the opportunity to create kind of public conversation and narrative around an issue where people were like, I mean, watching people post on, on Instagram that they got a vaccine right. or that they're wearing a mask at an event and they're okay with that. I mean, it kind of made my head spin. I was like, wow. Like, so then they posed this question of, you know, if we were to kind of like imagine rethinking HIV in the sense of the technology that we have today and the opportunity that we have to educate both from the online interventions and physical, um, what kind of a world would we live in? Yeah, well, I mean, I think we're also seeing this with monkeypox. Um, we're seeing people line up for the vaccine in public without, right. you know, concern for stigma and shame. Um, I think it does speak to the fact that we we have in many communities in the United States, <laughs> and I want to preface yeah. that. Because yeah. It's not true for so much of the world. You know, in Nigeria, it's illegal to have a same-sex partner, right? Yeah. So, right. you know, it's just, it's in the United States, in big cities, we've seen these really positive changes. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I'm realistic. I've covered HIV in more than 50 countries and uh, lots of places are still in the dark ages in sure. terms of stigma and discrimination. And, and also and in terms of just basic information, you know, sex education isn't common in yeah. a lot of places. Kids don't really understand, you know, basic things that we just kind of take for granted that they, right. don't, they don't get it. They don't know. So, I mean, I, I think we have to be really careful when we think globally. And I know that right. you, you work globally. Yep. You know, you're not just limited to Los Angeles. <laughs> no, but at the, and, and at the same time, I, you know, whenever I, I, whether it's an idea that I share or whether it's a, a you know, some concept that, that comes up programmatically, you know, it's, it's always my fellow advocates and, and my extended family across the globe that I that I do I have to run it by because I'm sitting there going, I did think this up in Venice Beach, California, right. and, I, and I'm not the one to answer whether this applies or not, but how do you feel about it? And that's really where, you know, from like the concert experience and even as you said in the, in, in the experience that you, that you shared about the, uh, the church uh, and, and the testing process of you know, HIV has also been put on this pedestal for so long. And it's kind of like all these other health issues that we're going to test for exist over here. And then HIV is kind of like a separate discussion. And, and I think COVID has also helped us in some ways as a community and, and, and through digital communication, what I see on Instagram across the globe is more of an embrace of holistic healthcare, um, almost destigmatizing mental health in a lot of ways. Um, and, and creating what I see is, you know, a sliver of this opportunity of can these tools, which we've just only started to really tap into in the last, you know, 15 years, because the technology hasn't been around that long, are these tools going to evolve into platforms that can further the impact of a positive impact in community health and mental health and kind of tearing down some of these past stigmas and educating around new information. I mean, I've met a 24 year old who was like in this was in in zambia and, and and he goes undetectable is untransmittable how long has that been around and right. then you're going okay uh it's been around for a while well how do i access the treatment it's right over there how much does it cost well it's free and this was all information that never reached this human being um and so i think that's the challenge and as a storyteller I mean, many challenges, but as a storyteller, from your point of view, I think that, I mean, storytelling has been how we've passed information down from generation to generation, to generation for all of time. Um, and so in that experience, 
do you feel that there's better ways, more innovative ways of how we can share stories and the platforms that are, that are spreading those stories in a positive way to get that information to those communities and better impact their opportunity for a better life? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a whole lot of reinventing the wheel that goes on. Mm. And so how do you help one place see success from another place? It's tricky. And so, if, you know, like look at look at South Africa, which has more people living with HIV than any country. And they have young girls getting infected at a terrifically high rate. I mean, that's a that's a real central issue in South Africa. How do you reach those young girls who don't have uh, often the power to, to go do things like even go to a clinic on their own to get a test or mm -hmm. the money to go? How do you reach them? I don't know. But I do know that if you approach the people who work with them, who live there, who are running outreach, and you ask them, hey, do you know what they're doing over here that's working? Have you tried this? That's where you start getting traction and you start seeing people adopt to their situation because sure. it has to be tailor-made. Yeah. It's all bespoke, the whole thing. You can't have a response that works in Venice in KwaZulu Natal, it sure. the drug the drugs work the same. There's mm -hmm. no biological difference between somebody who lives a human there and a human anywhere else, and that's something that frustrates me to no end. When people, when we have an, an advance of a new drug, and people say, "Oh, we will we have to test it in this other population." Well, well, yeah, but come on, really, like, what is it that we don't know? What are your real concerns? Right. What are we getting at? And often what we find, especially with like pre-exposure prophylaxis, what we found is that they want to test it in a new place because it's culturally difficult to roll out this mm, yeah. new intervention. It's not that there's a biological difference in somebody who sure. is this genetic background or that genetic background. And so I think I think there's a, a whole lot that that we can do to to take wheels that are spinning and working and show them to other places and say, okay, here, here's what a wheel looks like in this place. That's right. working. How do you want to, you know, how do you want to adapt this to make it work? And so what you did, for example, with a concert, right? Um, it's, it's specific to the place where you did it. That might not work in uh, some rural part of Thailand where sure. kids just don't go to concerts. It might have For no sure. currency whatsoever. And so when I've traveled around the world and done HIV stories, I've looked again and again at two questions, what's working and what isn't. Mm. And I've tried to- Both, both, e both equally is valuable. Both equally, because there, there's a disease that runs through the HIV response everywhere. And it, it's an allergy, that's the disease. And the allergy is toward self-criticism. Governments <laughs> and NGOs and companies, they're just not good at critically analyzing how what they're trying to do isn't working. Mm. And, and so part of my job is to come in and try to look critically at right. things that groups don't want to look at critically, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and and I would and I'm I'm heartened every time I see groups write a report about their own actions, the money they spent, the efforts, the outreach efforts they did, and critically look at what succeeded and what failed. Those reports yeah. are few and far between, sure. because everybody's worried about their reputation. They're worried about future funding, and right. you know they're worried about the wrong things. They should yeah. be worried about how do we do a better job. That's the right yeah, thing. Well, and I think that the whether you look at HIV, whether you look at COVID, um, it's not going to stop. The need for human response to healthcare is going to continue for as long as humanity exists. And at the end of the day, those that that invest in gaining a better understanding of, of challenging your own process, being self-critical, and and asking tough questions, and even throwing your hands up and being like, "We don't know," let's pass the microphone sure. to someone who can share their story and their voice with us so we may may gain a better a clearer understanding uh i always felt that those are the communities that are going to carry on to find longevity in their career 
because they're going to be able to bring those processes and practices to whatever comes next, you know? And, and I think we saw a decent amount of that when COVID hit with a lot of the individuals that have been a part of the HIV response for so long. And even some of the research in that space kind of folding over into the experience uh, with COVID response as well. And uh, I think we're, we're in a beautiful yet challenging time in history within HIV and AIDS and humanity where, uh, as you said, it's kind of this, this call to action of tear down the walls, go and invest in stakeholders that are within these communities that really understand what how their generation ticks, how their community moves, and all these unique nuances about them, and bring that back and give them a seat at the table to develop these concepts and these programmatic implementations that we move forward with. Yeah, one thing I've, I've learned watching programs around the world try to respond to HIV is that successful programs take advantage of whatever it is that leads people to congregate, whether it's mm. religion or surfing, there's a Cape Town surf school um, that, that does HIV education. Um, mm. Whatever it is that leads people, a concert, whatever it is that leads people to congregate is an opportunity to reach a lot of people in short order. And whatever it is that leads people to congregate is what leads to transmission of any pathogen, whether it's sexually transmitted or, or anything else. I mean, things that move between humans take advantage of people gathering. So that to me is the real key. I mean, I, I've been around Shabins in, in Botswana and um, that, are making homemade liquor that people gather around these homes to drink homemade liquor to do HIV intervention, you know, great mm -hmm. place to do a condom demonstration. Um, right. And, you know, and I've, and I've, I've been to, uh, you know, brothels that do education in the brothels and I've been to place to gay bars all over the world where, you know, there's a lot of education or there's a bowl of condoms on the counter, whatever it is, um, you right. know, bathhouses that do, education and intervention, or that, that that hold seminars, you know, that somebody's coming to town. They know people congregate at a bathhouse. Well, the bathhouse has a separate room where people can sit and listen to a talk. And they, they do that, they use it. They use the fact that people are congregating to mm. further the goal of helping people stay healthy. Right. And, you know, that, that to me is the secret sauce. It's, it's understanding where people congregate and as you did, tapping into it. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and where and why. And, and the hard thing, I think, is the internet culture and where people, I mean, forget about the fact that we separated ourselves during COVID. That was another issue altogether. That's a great <laughs> way to stop transmission of anything. But it's also a great way to stop testing. And it's a great way to stop getting people medication. You right, know, we had right. a lot of deficits that occurred because of that. But, of but we, we have so much congregation that's occurring you know, online that I don't know how, I'm not clever enough to know how to exploit that, mm. but there's a way to do it. You know, I think if I were in your business, I'd be looking at people that make things like Fortnite and Minecraft and asking, yeah. are there ways to, because, you know, that group of kids now it's, it's dicey when you're talking about HIV, because you, you know, what can you, you don't want to be, confront being confronted confronting issues of eight-year-olds uh having sexual information that their parents don't want them to have that's tricky True. Um, but, but i think that those 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 interventions um i think you find the interventions where you can really talk about hiv as a specific topic and then you can kind of step back zoom out a little bit and you talk about behavior and even just just human behavior and making better decisions for yourself those are types of incentivizations and gamifications that can exist through these types of experiences like you're expressing of where, how can you present kind of a, a continuation of questions and engagements amongst a younger generation to where they're experiencing the idea of getting rewarded for making good choices versus bad choices. And, and, and even if it's just a cognitive response, you know, it might not be them buying, you know, broccoli over candy at the grocery store, um, yeah. you know, or, or picking an apple over Twizzlers or whatever it's going to be. Um, you know, but just the idea of, of pick, you know, pick one A or B, um, or even if it's disseminating information. So if it's like, 
earn more coins through this game if you share this post about what it means to take care of your body. Sure. You know, and we can use the digital platform as as a means of of sharing valuable information. Yeah. The, and there, 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 there are opportunities. There are lots of opportunities. I'm I'm not smart enough to see them all. But I but I know the key ingredients that work. Mm-hmm. And you know, as I was saying about where people congregate, there's also something about where people I mean, it depends what you're trying to do. Are you trying to reach people who are living with HIV? That's a completely different goal. Sure. You know, and and if and you know, I I think I think you have to, as I said a moment ago, you have to tailor everything for that exact thing you're trying to do. I think we're also entering into a new era of long acting retrovirals that you know are gonna present you know, new opportunities for addressing some of the biggest problems, you know, mm-hmm. and, for, and for people who are living with HIV, there are a lot of people who have troubles taking daily meds, right? right? They just do. And I'm sure you've had days where you forgot. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, yeah. even just on the medication side. Yes. I've had days where I forgot, but I, there's also, I mean, the, the sound of that pill bottle yeah. also comes with stigma. You crack yeah. open a pill bottle, right? And people are like, well, why are you taking that pill? What's What right. did you do? What kind of decisions did you yeah. make? You know, oh, did you make a mistake? And yeah, what's wrong one with of the you? things that, yeah, what's wrong with you? And and I, a lot of what, what I'm constantly trying to, to look for within my friends and family and my community and the foundation is, A, how do we break down that stigma? So like I show people a lot of time, I'll take my pills in front of, an audience that I'm speaking in front of. And then, and then I like to show pictures of like these, you know, uh, gold medal Olympians who take, you know, 15 times the amount of vitamins that I do so that they can be the best athlete in the world. So like, why in the world is my medication stigmatized in that way? I think when it comes to uh, incentivizing those to, to take their medication in that way, we can even gamify and, and, and create rewards around that. I mean, whatever reten- works. No. Yeah, whatever works. I mean, retention's retention. Um, you know, but I think that there are a lot of reasons why you'd want to take your pills every day, not just for your own health, but for the opportunity that can come to you in your life. And I think even how we educate and express that information on a global scale, um, as it is not the same for every community, as you're saying, it has to be tailored. Um, but we have to better understand who we're talking to so that we can be able to speak with them in this way that is more impactful. You know, I mean, I have so many young. I mean, you know something else, Jake, that so much of HIV education that has had the most power has come from people living with the virus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, when you speak to a high school class, they're immediately in a different world because you're speaking from personal experience and they're confronted by that (laughs) that it's not abstract i I do something i do something when i I speak with high school classes occasionally about hiv and i and i've repeatedly done this thing where i ask i'm not living with hiv but i will ask the kids to raise their hands and say how many of you think i'm living with hiv and they're sheepish about it but i get you know some raise their hands whatever and then at the end of the class, I go, so uh, I'm going to tell you now, um, you know, get bet you're curious about whether I'm living with HIV. Uh, well, it's none of your business. And I would look exactly the same whether I was or wasn't. So thanks so much for having me. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I, I leave on that note to just yeah, put for it sure. Head. You don't know who's living with HIV. You can't look at someone and tell. And it's not important. And it's not your business. It's up to me. And so I think that what you do when you speak and you show your pills or whatever, you 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 replace whatever fantasies people, especially kids, yeah, first sure. about what it is. Yeah, and changing the perception. Change the perception with the reality that they can't argue with. <laughs> it's like. Hey, I'm living with this. <laughs> no. Yeah, totally. And those, I think those physical examples, it's funny. So you said like, raise your hand if you think this is, is, is a fact about me. So after I'll take my pills, I'll, I'll, I'll say, um, 
I'll say so. Uh, raise your hand in the audience if you take uh, a pill every day for something for anything, and and you know ninety nine percent of the time, like seventy five percent of the room raises their hand. If if they're yeah. my age, it's everyone. It's everyone. You're right. I mean, even my age now, 37, 38, everyone's taking a pill yeah, for something. I'm 63. So, everyone I know takes something. Yes. So you're sitting there going like, all right, like it doesn't, you know, you point the finger, you got three fingers pointing back at you, you know? So like we got to, we got to tear down a lot of these, these old beliefs, like you're saying. And a lot of that happens with that physical experience. Um, you know, for, for myself, I'll do the op- the same, but opposite of what you do when I go in and I sit there and I tell my story and I'm like, you know, I'm 37 years old. I'm HIV positive and I'm in great shape. I'm a, I'm a strong young man. I love, as you know, I love to surf. Um, and a lot of times people are like, really? And I'm like, well, what did you think this was going to be like? Because at the end of the day, the reality we live in right now is this is a chronic illness. If you make the right choices to take care of yourself just as you would if you went to the doctor and he said or she said you're diabetic yeah i know that that's certainly true and and when we look at like different chronic diseases living with hiv is not anywhere near the most difficult chronic disease to live with you know it's and it's becoming easier and easier because the medication's getting better and better yeah you know and i think you you come back from that idea and you say you know, as as a as an advocate um, and and as a fundraiser uh, in this space for a long time, you know, it's 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 it can be tough. You're fighting for the dollar. There's a lot of organizations out there. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think the uh, the the whatever I've looked in the, in whatever whether I'm reading the new reading the news, watching the news, and I see that word cure come up. Almost everyone in my world calls me and they're like, they found a cure. And I'm like, no, like, Hold your horses. <laughs> yeah, like, let's not erase the education and the progress we've made by putting false statements out there. <laughs> However, there is a moment where I like to say, but if you want to talk about that, I believe that we have a behavioral cure. If everyone knew their status and was on treatment and, and reached undetectable, we wouldn't be transmitting this virus. You want to challenges I see is I'm, I'm writing a book now about how can science help prevent future pandemics. And mm-hmm. one of the challenges I see is humans are really bad at prevention. Uh, we just don't do it well. We, we have a law that says you have to wear a seatbelt. I mean, how ridiculous is that? We have a law for motorcycle helmets that other states were forced to take off the books because uh, people didn't want motorcycle helmets you know, we have to convince people again and again to right. do things that are good for their health. Right. Um, you know, and so it's a, it's 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 about risk perception. And mm. I don't, I don't I'm, I'm studying this now because I'm really fascinated by our biases. And what you mm. deal with is often confronting that question of how do you convince people to take care of themselves and stay healthy? Sure. Uh, to prevent infection or to take care of the infection if you live with it. And uh, humans fear sharks, shark attacks, right? As surfers, we uh, know a thing or two about that fear. Yeah. But, yeah. but, you know, sharks, and you've seen the data before, far more people die from ladders, falling off right. a ladder than they do from sharks. And yet, you know, I use a ladder and, you know, <laughs> It, I understand the risk benefit. Well, and if you're trying to reach people with health messaging, right, you have to address that, that right. they don't understand their risks and the yeah. potential benefits of actions. It's, I mean, sure, people do. There are people who live their lives around making good, healthy decisions. But it's, I just think we're hardwired to have problems with that, with that risk benefit equation. And do you think that? that- in, in in your experience, do you think that the kind of the educational opportunities for supporting a better decision based on that the risk benefit equation that as we see it, you know, it, it's like um like right now, it's like, you know, I think earlier you talked about taking testing to the places where people are congregating. Yeah. You know, I feel like it we're still in this space where it's like the discussions, whether it's HIV or or, or other issues, are still happening in silos. 
this this isn't a racial issue. This isn't a sexual identity issue. This is a human issue, you know. And and adopting uh, a a more inclusive experience around that communication. Yeah, and you know, I mentioned this church in Nigeria that was bundling HIV with other diseases. Right. I think that's really smart. Yeah, I, me I too. You know, I don't. I don't think you need to separate it out. It it's part of being healthy to to understand your risks. Uh, and if it, if there the more ways we can bundle it, the more ways we can figure out how to make it part of a larger picture, something yep. bigger, the better. Totally. Because, you know, people people will respond to that. The, it, it will get it will make more of uh, of an impact uh, if it's not if it's not siloed. Yeah, no, I I completely agree, um, and I think that's something that will take a lot of effort because we spent so long focusing on it in that silo kind of perspective, um, you know. But one thing that that you know, I don't know if it I you I, have you visited egg path sites, yeah, in Africa, sure. yeah. You know, one of the things I love, um, and and yes, my mom started the organization, and it's my family name on the door, and that's that's all wonderful as just a perspective of a human being experiencing our programs you know one of the things that i really love about the partnerships we have in the community that we work with is we very quickly understood that it's not just hiv we can focus on and our and our facilities focus on the it's it's holistic family health care it's a plethora of issues and and it's a, a destination where community members can come to 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 receive whatever uh, uh, treatment and care and even psychosocial support that they might need. I think the interesting component to it though, that I, that I continuously reflect on is those spaces in some ways still represent a, like, why do you go there kind of mentality and how do we evolve it into like, well, why don't you go there? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's the, the concept of like, you know, stop driving the, the, the 67 Mustang, because it's the cool car that's guzzling gas. Why aren't you driving a Prius? What do you not care about the environment? Right. And so it's like, these are these kind of generational and systemic perceptions that also need to, to evolve. Um, and I think that again, going back to like the, the private stakeholders, sponsors of these organizations of our organization and, and many others, um, in their responsibility to their communities and they could come to the table and say like, how can we work on dressing up these types of environments to make them more attractive so that we, there is retention so that when someone comes, they are getting stoked because they're seeing that kind of common thread that connects them to their generation. Like, so, you know, I think, I mean, thank you for so much insight from, from your history. Um, but even looking now with like where we're headed, um, a lot of food, food for thought for myself and hopefully everyone listening. I mean, I think, I think you're also putting your finger on something that uh, people call structural issues. If you're, mm. if you don't have a place to live and if you don't have food, you're going to have a really hard time thinking about your health. Mm. And so what a lot of uh, groups like yours do is help people address those fundamental structural issues so they can <laughs> care about their health you know True. if you're you're worried about uh sleeping in a, in a dangerous in a place where you're not safe where you're not warm uh you know your the odds that you're going to be caring much about your health drop sure you got other more pressing needs and i and i think that's one of the offshoots of the whole hiv response is there's been a recognition that it's way beyond simply testing someone and giving them drugs sure no uh, i think it's a it's a community response i think we can always improve on collaboration um and i think those collaborative collaborative opportunities also kind of exist out of the obvious you know and and being self-critical in that experience and going and looking at like what you know perhaps the least obvious concept out there becomes the most impactful because you know a lot of times in that darkest corner where we don't think to look that's where I lost my keys. Thank you for your commitment uh, to to sharing stories and and being uh, a, a, for for myself and for so many. I think a reliable source of information. And thank you for challenging the perspective oh. and the status quo on things. Thank you for saying those kind of things. Thanks a lot, Jake.
Of course. All right. Well, till next time, uh, I look forward to future conversations and have yourself an amazing weekend. All right. You too.